Hey there, everyone. Today on the final bar, a risk-off move for stocks. The S&P 500 and the Nasdaq both down over 1% going into the close. Home builders popping higher on the Warren Buffett bounce. And Dave Landry joining us from New Orleans, sharing three things he wishes he knew when he was just getting started trading. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny and hot Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the action in the markets using the best practices of technical analysis. When things get uncertain, when things get a little squirrely, when things get volatile, I found the charts can be really helpful. Number one, just to keep you centered and focused on the most important evidence, the most important information, but it also gives you a structured way of navigating these, uh, these volatile periods, right? At the end of the day, can you take a step back from the markets and make that basic assessment? Are we going up? Are we going down? Are we going sideways? I think that basic starting point can be the foundation for a really rigorous and, uh, and, and comprehensive way of analyzing uh, the markets. We have a great guest today, Dave Landry. He's going to be sharing some uh, words of wisdom, some lessons learned uh, through his successful career trading. But Dave is one of the best at really focusing, I think, on the simple, right? Thinking about up, down, and sideways, how you characterize charts and how you focus on actionable ideas. Now, today we have a bit of a risk-off feel. We'll talk about markets uh, and equities in particular rotating to the downside. Financials, energy leading the way lower. Let's dig into the charts and see what they can tell us about the overall trends here as we start our market recap. Before we get to the charts, by the way, we're going to start with a poll. We always have, always have a poll going for our YouTube subscribers to make sure, you, make sure you check us out there. Also on X and our social media platforms as well. We asked you recently, where will Bitcoin be one month from today? And I love the definitive way that we asked that question. Where will it be in one month? Within 10% of current levels, at least 10% higher or at least 10% lower. 10% lower, narrowly getting the most votes. But this was pretty spread evenly, to be honest with you, between these three. And I think that tells you a lot about the conditions right now for Bitcoin. There are times with stocks, with Bitcoin, with any sort of market where it feels like everything makes sense, right? It feels like it's obviously an uptrend. I think of the S&P in 2021 maybe is an example of that. Uh, obviously in a downtrend, which would be the S&P 500, the NASDAQ in 2022, and then kind of a question mark, which is, I would say, probably what the S&P and the NASDAQ are today, and Bitcoin as well, right? Look at where we're at right now versus where we were in early April, late March. We're kind of at the same level. So we've had quite a bit of movement from 25,000 on the lower end, 32,000 almost on the upper end, and now we're kind of right at the midpoint, a uh, little bit to the upper end of that uh, of that range, but still kind of range bound, right? So if you think of that initial thrust higher off of the uh, November low, the higher low in March testing the 200-day moving average, the high point now around 31,000 in mid-April, from there we've now sort of bounced between these levels. So, you know, what's interesting, again, is uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've sort of chopped around here. We broke below the 50-day moving average at the end of July. To me, that was sort of the red flag telling me, okay, when things are above the 50-day in a corrective period, they're just not getting that bad. Because until you break the 50-day moving average, it's still pretty much in an uptrend. But when you break the 50-day, that's when you have to start to think a little bit more about potential further downside retracement. But from that break, we haven't gone any further. So you really didn't get any follow through above 31,000. We really haven't had any follow through below 29,000. So I would say in the short term, kind of the tactical period, that's your range, right? About a 2,000 point swing from the lower end, end of July, mid-August, to the upper end around 31,000, June, July. I'd wait to see which way we break out of that range. And that's probably how I would want to answer that, uh, answer that question. If I had to answer, I'd probably say within 10% of current levels because what Bitcoin has told you is that it's pretty much in a sideways trend. It's in a consolidation phase. I consider that sort of phase at play until proven otherwise, which is why, again, for me, a break above 31K or a break below 29K, that would be the real sign uh, of, a, of a change of character for Bitcoin, in my opinion. Let's get to the S&P and the other major equity averages See what the damage was. So a bit of a risk-off feel today. You had retail sales earlier uh, overnight. You had uh, China coming off uh, as the economic data there was a lot uh, weaker than normal or weaker than expected, I should say. Uh, so uh, sort of a risk-off feel to the tape today. And it really progressed through the course of the day, accelerated lower in the last hour of trading. So the S&P finishing down 
about 1.2%. That 4,500 level continues to be a key ceiling. We actually touched there barely earlier in the day today and then rotated lower. So 4438, that's where we ended the day for the S&P. The Nasdaq, almost an identical percent move to the downside, also the Dow. So there have been times here recently where it's like the Dow up, the Nasdaq down, and the S&P in the middle. This was not one of those days. It was kind of an everything down kind of uh, kind of day. And again, not by much. This is not an end of the world. I don't think the word plunge is the verb I would use to describe today's market, although I'm Sure, somewhere we can find websites that would describe it that way. It's certainly a move lower, though. Mid caps and small caps down as well. The mid cap S&P 400 led the way down by about 1.4%, and the VIX pushing back to the upside. So we've talked about volatility in its traditional relationship with stocks. In general, stocks move lower on higher volatility. That's the general relationship. In a slow and steady uptrend, volatility tends to remain low. We're coming off of a period of extreme low volatility for recent history, right? The VIX actually got down to a 12 handle not too long ago, now bouncing back higher. Day like today, moving up a full point and a half, uh, up to uh, 16.4 or so as we finish the trading day. Let's look elsewhere. You can see the interest rates moving higher. It was actually an interesting day. If you look at the two-day sort of preview chart of the 30-year or the 10-year, you can see a gap higher in rates and then a move lower and then a move back higher. So what basically happened there is yields spike out of the open. That's because bonds opened a lot lower. Investors, traders originally came in and bought that weakness, which caused that initial bounce in bond prices or a move lower in yields. But by the end of the day, we kind of went right back. So it wasn't sort of a buy on the dips and that's it. It was sort of a buy on the dips, but then that trade sort of got unwound. By the end of the day, 10-year yields finishing higher. Uh, the 10-year yield currently around 422, long bond yield around 432, similar to the five-year uh, five yield around 438. Uh, dollar index, not too much of a change from yesterday, to be honest with you. So no real danger, I think, in terms of a, you know an excessively strong dollar that would you know, sort of fuel a risk-off sort of environment. You're not really getting that uh, in today's session in particular. All red on the chart of the, uh, or on the list of the top eight commodity ETFs that we track. Gold and silver, both down about a quarter of a percent. The DBC, which is a broader commodity ETF, down about 1.2%. That was really led by the energy components here. So gas down 2.1%. Natural gas, the UNG, down almost 5% today. And crude oil using the USO was down 1.6%. So energy having a pretty tough day, down over 2%. We'll get to the sector uh, movements here in a moment. Finally, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and Ether, both down about 1% for the day. Again, Bitcoin still below that uh, 31,000, 30,000 level, as we highlighted on the, uh, on the chart relative to the poll question uh, earlier in the recap. Uh, so Bitcoin finishing the day just around 29,150. And Ether around 1825. And again, still remaining below those key sort of big round numbers that you'd want to see a break above to really validate a new uptrend. Not seeing that yet. I would say still consolidation at best for those uh, leading cryptocurrencies. Looking at sector returns, so a couple having not bad of a down day, but all 11 of the S&P sectors in the red when all was sell and done, said and done. And this is one of those where you saw financials and energy kind of weak out of the open. Everything kind of rotated lower through the course of the day. The XLV, the healthcare sector, uh, healthcare ETF, the best performer, still down about a third of a percent, followed by communication services and technology, uh, all down about 1% or less. On the downside, yet a couple sectors really struggling. Energy down 2.1%, financials down 1.8%, additional news flow about uh, you know, banks being downgraded potentially, uh, and that's just putting downside pressure on all of the, the major banks, the KBE, the KRE which are uh, some uh, bank and uh, regional bank ETFs that we tend to uh, tend to favor or, or, or like to highlight uh, down pretty good as well. Utilities and materials also down about 1.6%. Let's go to a daily chart of the S&P and see what happened today. And it's not good news if you've been following the show and paying attention to those levels, right? We like to define a line in the sand. What's that level? And as long as we hold above it, things aren't getting that bad. But if we start to break it, that's where we need to really think about further downside uh, objectives. I think it's happening here today with the S&P rolling down and rolling uh, below, making a new low for the last week. That closed around 44.37. That gets us below the 50-day moving average on a closing basis for the first time since March of this year. Back here, that's the last time you were below the 50-day. Uh, the Today's down uh, downdraft sort of pushes us below that level, also below trendline support. So you take the March low and the May low, 
That kind of lines up with the 50-day moving average this week. So closing below those today, not a good look for stocks. Uh, always, uh, when you see this sort of breakdown or any sort of breakout, uh, breakout, in my opinion, you were looking for a follow-through, right? What happens the day after? So I think through the remainder of this week, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, it's all about do we get that downside follow-through. The fact that we're closing below these levels is not a good thing. That sort of the in initiates that uh, sort of bearish pattern, in my opinion. Follow through tomorrow would really solidify this as a as a fairly weak chart, certainly on the short term time frame. That would uh, tell me to start looking at further downside support. And I have these handy handy shaded areas that haven't really come into play for a while. I have all these great uh, you know potential support levels. We just haven't needed them for a while. But here they are right where we left them. So if we do follow through tomorrow, I would suggest 4,300, that first downside objective. And that's really more of, a, uh, of, a, of an initial target. And I think that's based on the August 22 high. That was a pretty important level that we focused on in early June uh, and, uh, and earlier in 2023. Once we broke that and retested it here in June, that was sort of the final argument to the bull breakout case. Now that we're coming back, that's reasonable to expect some additional support there. I think the real uh, end of the day, it's going to be down in this area, sort of that 4150, 4200 level. That would be the first Fibonacci support level. That would be a trend line off of the October and March lows. The 200-day moving average is kind of going to end up in that general area, depending on how quickly we come off. So if you get further downside, what's good about a market like this is we have some pretty clear support levels, I think, in the uh, in the rearview mirror, they're starting to come back into the forefront as we rotate a little bit lower. So let's see if we get follow through uh, tomorrow. RSI, by the way, right at the end, the lower end of the acceptable bullish range. RSI gets below 40. This starts to feel a little more like a distribution phase, in my opinion. So we'll see what happens uh, as uh, things maybe progress here. Now, I mentioned uh, volatility, how the VIX has spiked higher again. You know, I think one of the key charts, we think about what charts kind of tell the story of the market. For me, the VIX has been a key chart in the last six to 12 months. It really, this decline in volatility, particularly over the last couple of months, and the really low levels, right? Taking us below the lows we were in 2021, I think pretty important. We've had a rally here, particularly uh, as the, uh, the beginning of the summer months, on very low volatility. And, and in my opinion, what's great about that kind of environment is you're just looking for a spike in volatility as, a, as an early warning sign that things are changing, right? Because market rallies on low vol, it's sort of a slow and steady move. The way that changes is something happens to make investors nervous. That usually causes the initial gap lower, which I think we, we saw about a week and a half, two weeks ago. And now you're seeing volatility increase. So the higher that the VIX gets, the wider that high yield, high yield spreads get, I think that more and more validates sort of a risk off environment. We come off a bit uh, of the uh, higher VIX. VIX got to around 17 about a week ago. Came back a little bit today, just pushing right back up toward the upper end. So I think the higher this chart of the VIX gets, the less and less optimistic I would be about a big rally from here, because this is telling you that investors are nervous. There's some additional uncertainty, and there's a lot of room to be more nervous and more uncertain when you look at where the VIX has been over the last 18 months and how low we are recently. So I think that's an important chart, certainly, to, uh, to pay attention to. Also wanted to highlight 10-year uh, yields. We've, we've highlighted this chart a number of times. I think it's worth noting 10-year uh, yield almost getting to a new high here for the cycle. Uh, the uh, June 2022 high was back here around, uh, you know, 3.5%. The October 2022 high around 43 a little bit above that uh, percent. We're kind of right back up to that level. So look at this rounded bottoming pattern that 10-year yields have been uh, pounding out. Rates going higher like this. And again, a day like today, you saw rates... Uh, you know, initially spike, come down, and then push higher. That's as bond prices are coming down. So what's interesting is as stocks are selling off, bonds seem to be selling off even more, and that's what's causing the stock-to-bond ratio. If you look at the SPY versus the TLT, still very handily favoring stocks over bonds. And I think rising rate environment, just not a great setup for growth stocks. This is the ratio or the relative performance of value versus growth. It's kind of been sideways, to be honest with you, for the last uh, eight to 10 weeks. Higher rates, if you think rates are going above current levels, going above four and a quarter, up to four and a half plus, most likely this ratio goes higher because it's not a, a hospitable environment, not an ideal environment for growth stock. Just makes the growthy part of the of growth stocks uh, less attractive because uh, rates higher now just basically means those future earnings are less valuable. And as a result, it uh, usually means value stocks are going to outperform. Today, not that look, right? We saw financials and energy uh, actually struggling quite a bit. 
Now, as we think about this idea of growth versus value, I'm immediately drawn to uh, the uh, FANG stocks, or what I call the Menomina stocks, sort of those eight mega cap stocks in three sectors, technology, consumer discretionary, communi communication services. If you look at the chart of Alphabet, look at this peak here in June. You had this bearish candle pattern, a bearish engulfing pattern there that led to the next uh, you know, four weeks, we'll call it, pulling back to an ascending 50-day moving average. Now, stocks like Apple and Microsoft have broken down through their 50-day, which I think has been kind of a negative development in the, uh, in the markets here over the last couple of weeks. But you can see Alphabet actually bounced off of its 50-day and gapped above that level of resistance. Here's the problem. We gapped above the June high, and then it totally fizzled out. If you take the resistance around 127, 128, that's the resistance in June. That's pretty much become the support now. So we did gap above that level. We made a new high for the year. That's all good. But that's been it. We haven't had any upside follow through. So you have stocks like Apple and Microsoft breaking down. You have stocks like Alphabet, which have gapped higher. But instead of following through, showing you additional buyers are coming in, it's actually stalled out, basically telling you that there are no additional buyers. There's no buying power pushing breakout stocks even further. And I think that is more characteristic of a market in a corrective phase. This is one of the sort of anecdotal pieces of evidence that tell me to expect uh, you know, further downside versus upside until these sort of charts start to work. Right? The leading stocks have to keep leading uh, if you expect further upside. Now, I mentioned some issues in two particular sectors, two worst sectors today, financials and energy, and then kind of everything else uh, in the red, but uh, less and less so. PayPal, which is really kind of financial technology. It's kind of in the middle of those sectors, if you, uh, if you will, down about 6% today, making a new 52-week low uh, today or very, very close to doing so. Not a great look. And again, the problem I have with the chart of PayPal before today is the fact that we've been below a downward sloping 200-day moving average for a long time. So back here in late 2021, when we broke below the 200-day, we've been below a downward sloping 200-day pretty much 100% of the time from that moment on. So today's gap lower, certainly not a good development, but this is the latest move among a trend that has been lower. So I think the medium-term, long-term trend on PayPal has been pretty weak, and you're just not seeing any signs of change. These rallies to the 200-day have failed to materialize with any gains above that, and I think that's a telling development there uh, for PayPal. More of a traditional sort of bank name would be something like uh, Zion's Bank or a regional bank. And if you look, again, the 200-day also confirming weakness. Zion's actually had traded from the low in May all the way up a double to testing the 200-day in mid-July. So two months later, the stock price has doubled. We're up to a declining 200-day moving average. Unfortunately, we've just stalled out there. And again, so this is one of those characteristics of a bear market phase or a bearish uh, phase, a, a pullback phase, is you see stocks that you would think if all conditions are good, you'd see a chart like this break out. It's not happening. It's kind of stalling out, uh, stalling out at resistance. So when stocks that should be breaking out don't appear to be, that tells me to be more skeptical about, uh, about any market upside and expect a further retrenchment. You're seeing uh, Zion's other regional banks really feeling the pain down about four and a half percent today. Could be a, pre, uh, uh, a, uh, a beginning of uh, further decline. We'll see if we're able to hold this short-term range. That's it for our market recap. A lot of charts to get to. Wanted to highlight some of those general developments and where we might, uh, might see some opportunities. I'm going to bring on today's guest here, Dave Landry, in a moment. Before we do there, a couple quick announcements. First off, our mailbag. would love to get your question. We fuel the mailbag by people like you uh, sending us your questions as you were trying to use the Stock Charts platform and use technical analysis to make better decisions. Email us your questions, won't you? At the final bar at stockcharts.com on Twitter. Just tag us in a comment at Final Bar SCTV. And on our YouTube channel, it's easy. Just drop a comment below the video you're watching. We would love to hear from you and uh, particularly your questions that we can use in our next mailbag, which will be Friday of this week. Also, as a reminder, we'll be doing our next YouTube live Q&A tomorrow on Wednesday the 16th, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. I'll have a couple charts prepared for you to get things started, and then it will all be your questions. So jump on in uh, right on time if you can. Put your questions. It could be anything, a particular ticker you want to look at, a particular technical indicator that you're struggling with, an idea, uh, a, uh, uh, something from our chart school that you want more color on. Anything and anything, anything and everything is, uh, is welcome. So make sure you tune in there. And if you go to our YouTube channel now, you can actually set a reminder to make sure you don't miss it. Tomorrow, Wednesday the 16th, YouTube live Q&A at 1 p.m. Eastern. 
I want to welcome on today's guest, Dave Landry. Dave has been a frequent and very welcome guest on Stock Charts TV and on my show, The Final Bar. He's the founder of DaveLandry.com, coming to us from just outside New Orleans, Louisiana. Dave, good to see you. How are you these days? All right? Good. Doing good. How about you, Dave? Hanging in there. I feel like this uh, this uh, last couple of weeks had been a lot less of a nice, slow and steady bull market. Things yeah. starting to change. And I think a lot of a lot of traders, a lot of investors are kind of struggling with the uh, with the with the volatile nature of how the markets are evolving. How are you making sense before we get to a really cool uh, set of uh, set of points that you want to make? How are you making sense of this market? Again, another drawdown today. Well, you know, the, uh, the, the old saying is sell the man go away. And, and that's just not true. And it's been a fantastic summer. However, last couple of weeks have been really, really tough. And that's where a lot of things you pointed out today, watch that 50 simple moving average. Look at the net net price move. We hadn't made any forward progress in a couple of months. So now it's the time to kind of sit on your hands. Like I said, in the market a minute this morning, it's better to be on the dock drinking beer, wishing you out to sea than out to sea, wishing you were on a dock. And you know the same thing as far as it goes about flying, of course. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And you're absolutely right. That, that's, a, that's a classic one, right? I mean, the, and, and you've all often mentioned there's a time to sort of wait things out and see how they play out. Certainly giving that, uh, giving that feel here this week. You offered to, uh, to do another sort of a, a special discussion for us, which I super, super uh, appreciate. Uh, you were going to share with us three things you wish you knew about trading when you were just getting <laughs> started. I am super excited to hear what you want to share with us. Get us started. What's the first one? Okay, the first thing is there's no holy grail, and, and you know a lot of people, and you know a lot more than I do, but I know a lot of people too. We're both members of the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts, and I feel like somebody in that organization or some of the organizations, the CMT, for instance, would have found it if there was one, and if they did find it, then there would be no more markets, but that's another discussion altogether. I think we're drawn into trading because, boy, it sure does look easy, and that's exactly why it's so hard in a lot of cases. And what's interesting is everyone tends to go through this trader's journey where they add all this complexity. And, and what's amazing is as soon as somebody just starts to figure it out a little bit, I've got a lot of people in my Facebook group, you know, you see these guys and they struggle, they struggle and all of a sudden, okay, I think I got it. But then they immediately add complex complexity to it. <laughs> so I could probably save you 20 years. Just don't go through that, that, that grail hunt. And I was thinking right before we went live, I probably had three or 400 books on technical analysis that I shipped away and gave to my clients because all I really use is maybe one indicator, just a moving average, and that's about it. So keep it really, really simple. Find something simple that works. If you can't make something simple work, then something more complex is not going to work. And I would say just use one pattern to, to become successful. And uh, Linda Rasky once said, all you need is one pattern to be successful, obviously. And... I believe if you can't reduce it down to a to a cocktail napkin, then your trading system is is far too complex. And I forget who said it, but we you know we start with simplicity, we go to complexity, complexity, and then when we get back to the beginning is is when it starts to actually make sense. And that journey could be two years for for people, or it could be twenty years. And recently, I literally got a letter. People actually still write letters, believe it or not. And some guys like I'm working on a system, and he was a client from twenty years ago. And he's still working on systems. And it's like at some point in time, mm. just trade something simple and make it work. And then people say, well, what's that one pattern? You know, something like Landry Light pullbacks. And, and it's a really simple pattern. You're looking for Landry Light, which is lows greater than the moving average. It's illustrated down below. After about 20 bars of that, look for a pullback to the moving average. And ideally, you want a few things like acceleration and persistency and all these things I preach about. But here's a simple little pattern. This is the last two trades that we uh, took and got stopped out of. We still have a couple open, but they were they came from this very uh, simple pattern. And, and all you need is this one pattern, and maybe this might be the one pattern. So again, if you're not successful with something simple, you're not going to be successful with something more complex. Now, the other thing is, and here's a biggie, something I talk about often is the battle is within. And we're not made to trade on a psychological level and over the last, I keep saying a few years, but it's been over 10 years, I just learned that, or learned 10 years ago, <laughs> that it's also on a neurological basis. There's a lot of things that are that are happening inside our brain that that really don't uh, do us any, any justice when it comes to trading. One thing is, there's a lot of ex uh, extraneous influences, a lot of things that have nothing to do with your trading that are kind of bugging you. It's like your life, expected expenses, unexpected expenses, Maybe a, a fight with your your spouse, significant other, or, or both, you know. <laughs> and, 
and you've got to really, really watch yourself. And and a lot of times, for instance, I'll see people like, uh, well, I like this setup, but and so I, I say, watch your butts. And through watching my Facebook group, especially when things get choppy like now, all of a sudden they're throwing up setups and they're just trying to make something happen instead of just kind of letting that market come to you. So along those lines, I think I think less is more. Figure out how not to trade. And, and if you do that, of course, that's the holy grail. But it's not so hard. But what's hard is not trading when you're not supposed to be trading. And believe me, I'm as guilty as any. So I would spend 10 times as, 10 times as much time you do grow hunting as you do on the trading psychology. And also you want to make sure that again, you don't actually want to grail hunt. Like I just said, you want to find something simple. And if you want to grail hunt on the side, that's fine. But but don't make that your constant hamster wheel to where you do that and you never get anywhere. It's and so think, funny, uh, D- Dave, your, your second one. Yeah, talking about um, forcing it, right? I, I feel like so many times when people kind of get, they have a run of bad uh, performance or, or you know a stretch of underperformance, you feel like you want to trade your way out of it, right? If you could just oh, absolutely. take, if you can make enough trades, you can kind of get it. How do you catch yourself from that? I mean, that, that that's a downward spiral. And then I feel like the additional trading just kind of creates more and more havoc. How do you prevent getting into that feedback loop of uh, of underperformance? Well, you're gonna have you're gonna have to really pay attention to what you're doing. And and what's weird about trading, it, it's it's uh, sometimes you feel like Einstein's definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. And then other times you're kind of like Churchill's definition of success is doing the same thing, uh, failure after failure, whatever, paraphrasing without any loss and enthusiasm. So you've got to document what you're doing and figure out whether you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. And sometimes, like you just said, it's and I think Greg Morse once said it too, it's the worst time to to change a system is in the, in the middle of a drawdown where it doesn't seem to be working just right. And then, yeah. you know, the other thing too, you need to ask yourself, is it me or the markets? Well, first of all, it's you for trading the markets. But second of all, it could be something that's going on with your personal life that that could be influencing your trades. Yeah, your mindset is so critical. All right, so we have number one, there's no holy grail. Number two, the battles within. It's what happen, what's happening between your ears, probably. What's item number three? What's the third one? You, you wish well, you know, you can't talk about trading when I talk about money management. And it, it, it kind of, they all three are intertwined. You got the methodology, money management, and of course your mind. And if you're trading at a small size, then mentally it's not going to be that hard to do the right thing. And you need to trade a size that's almost meaningless and then start and build if you're not making money trading small size you're not going to make money trading big size you're just going to lose more and that's what kills everybody they get too big too fast and then the other thing is a good offense you know you need a good defense but a good offense is very important i get asked about stocks all the time where would i put my stop in the stock and i'm like well let's time out for a second i wouldn't trade that stock anyway it looks like a ledger cardiogram let's find something that looks better so your chances of getting stopped out or less. So definitely money management, obviously important too. Mm, it's so helpful. And I, and I love how you, you kind of describe these, these three, three different things. You know, going back to your first one, uh, Dave, talking about there's no holy grail. I've, I've seen so many new investors that kind of get started. And just like you and I probably did, you buy a ton of books and you keep yeah. searching for that thing. And it's like, if you read enough books, you'll finally hit that one page of the one book that has all the answers. And all you need to do is keep repeating that. How long did it take you to sort of recognize that that wasn't what life was like as a trader? And how can you help our, our viewers kind of shorten that lifespan of, of, of going through that holy grail hunt? I would say at least five years, and that's probably yeah. ex- exaggeration to the downside. It probably was a lot longer <laughs> than that. But the bottom line is, if you look at a chart, the bottom line is you just need to capture a price move. All you have to do, right? Well, it's a lot easier said than done. But when you boil it all down, look at the net-net price move. It is a stock going up, down, or sideways. And if it's going up, how can I get in this trend? Maybe wait for a pullback to the moving average and then wait for it to to trigger an entry like the cocktail napkin approach. So I would, you know, it's hard. It seems like everybody has to go through this grail hunt. But I would say just kind of skip through it and just stay at the beginning and then do that like on the side, but make something Mm. simple work first and just take one of, and I spent 30 years working on pullbacks. Just take something simple from me or anyone else for that matter, and then trade it. But you have to trade it through good times. You got to trade it through bad. You know, just real quick, one thing I see a lot too is when people have a little bit of success, they're like, I got to figure it out. And it's not like a switch flips. It's a constant battle. It's a constant struggle. I struggle a lot, believe me. And it's like they go on and they and they they they'll quit a day job or they'll tell the boss to f off or whatever you know 
because they think they got it all figured out. And, and it kills me too from my educational business. As soon as I get a few winners and show them a few winners and they make money on the winners, they're off, you know, and it's like, well, hang on, you know, just hang around. I'll, I'll, I'll still, you know, I could help you, you know, down the road, but it, yeah. it, it just, uh, it's just a flip side of what you would think success is actually worse than initial struggling. So if you're struggling, that's good. You're working mm -hmm. on it. If you think you, you think you've got to figure it figured out, you're doomed. That's so I know great. I kind of went around the, no, the I love that. I love that, David. No, and, and what's funny is I, I, I find people get into trouble when they feel like they have all the answers. I think you, you do a great job of, of sharing, you know, this is what, when it worked, this is when it didn't, this is what I learned, and I, I hope you and yeah. I and, and others continue to learn. We only have about a minute left, but you're, and people should know, the first time I met you, we went to a conference, you literally handed out the cocktail napkins with the three <laughs> directions on, which I'll never forget. When you're looking at the major equity averages, the S&P, the NASDAQ, whatever you think is the most uh, relevant, which of those arrows do you think best describes where we're at? Are we in a down arrow at this point? And, and how would you sort of classify or characterize a rotation? I, I think you brought up a lot of good points tonight. I'm a little bummed out to the NASDAQ, and I haven't looked at the charts just yet. I haven't done my analysis. But as of last night, the NASDAQ was rolling over a little bit. The bow tie moving average is 10 simple, 20 exponential, and 30 exponential, which you could you have an ACP, obviously, if you have yep. ACP. Those are beginning to roll over into bow tie to the downside. It's not the end of the world, but you might want to pull your horns in a little bit. S&P 500 looking that way a little bit. And then a lot of other areas are beginning to roll over. And that's another thing going back to the beginning, net, net price movement. And you, you hinted to that earlier or mentioned that earlier. Never forget about the net net. Where's the market now? Where was it yesterday? Where was it a week ago? Where was it two weeks ago? And then if it's going sideways, then you might not want to be in it. And if it's going down, then you either want to start thinking about shorting or make sure you honor your stops and be selective on going long again. Right now, I think is one of those times where, where we really need to be selective. Let's let it shake out. Maybe the summer doldrums finally hit. We've had a great summer mm. up until now. Let's just see what happens. And let the market come to you. That hey, add that to the, to the list for me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's our bonus number four there. Yeah, Dave, listen, yeah. this was awesome. Thanks for doing these kind of things. I, I feel like this is something investors and traders don't make enough time for, and I think uh, people watching today probably got a lot of really good uh, words of wisdom from you. Thanks for joining us on the show. Stay safe, be well there in uh, New Orleans. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you, Dave. That's Dave Landry. Dave's the founder of DaveLandry.com. What a pleasure to have someone like Dave share, you know, three things he wished he knew about trading as he was getting started. I, I would love to have a number of successful traders, investors share these kind of lessons learned. And I, and I feel like every one of those bullet points, Greg, Greg Morris, who's a mentor of mine, always would say that, you know, the items on, a, on a, an aviation checklist are all accidents that happened that created that bullet point. I feel like Dave probably has some scars for each one of those bullet points that he offered, but what a great opportunity to learn from someone who's, uh, who's certainly gotten it done over his, uh, his career. Great lessons learned there by uh, Dave Landry of DaveLandry.com. We have to wrap the show, folks, and go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. How can we capture, I feel like there's so much going on, picking just three is tough these days, but we'll do our best. Healthcare, the number one sector today. And this is not the first day that that's happened. You know, when I'm thinking about charts and thinking about, uh, you know, leadership rotation, I'm drawn to a couple different things. Number one, focusing on the simple message of price, right? Is, uh, is the price of this sector or this group going up or going down? And when you'll notice something like the Qs or the S&P or the XLK or the XLC kind of rotating lower, testing moving averages and failing, healthcare is actually doing the opposite. It's putting in a higher low in early August, actually rotating uh, higher to test resistance from uh, July. What's more compelling to me is the message of relative strength. This is why the RRG, Julius de Kempner's methodology, I've always been a big fan of because it visualizes how the sector leadership picture is evolving day to day, week to week, month to month. And I think you're starting to see the signs of a sector like healthcare, which don't get me wrong, has been a brutally underperforming sector for most of 2023 until about a month ago. And from mid-July to now in mid-August, you're actually seeing the relative strength start to, uh, to improve. So if you've ignored healthcare because it's been a dog of a sector and it's been underperforming, maybe you'll start to see those names and uh, groups start to pop up on a new swing highs list. I would pay attention to healthcare if you've not been doing so uh, so far this year. Chart number two, looking at the financial sector, I mentioned energy, financials, the two worst performing sectors today. A uh, number of banks, uh, sort of implications that may have additional uh, downgrades, uh, and that's going to hurt. And you're seeing both of the uh, KBE, which is a bank ETF, and the KRE, 
uh, the uh, regional bank ETF, and I'm actually noticing these are the same ones. So real time, I am showing how easy it is to edit my uh, stock charts platform. There we go. So now we have the KBE on the top, the KRE regional banks on the bottom. Both of these below a downward sloping 200 day moving average. One of my mentors had the blunt forced approach, which was nothing good happens below the 200 day moving average. And while I wouldn't totally agree with that assessment, it has been a great guiding principle to just make a very basic assessment. Is this thing I'm looking at above an upward sloping 200 day or below a downward sloping 200 day? That starting point can give you a good sense of kind of where we've come from. And then you can start to get a little more detailed about the particular dynamics and where we might be at in the cycle. I'm concerned that both of these ETFs had a nice rally. Some of these stocks doubling off of the lows, but now stalling out and now rotating lower. The gap today may be the beginning of further deterioration. I'm concerned about what I'm seeing on the chart of the financials. That's the KBE and the KRE. I've highlighted for chart number three a number of uh, candle patterns here recently. Just uh, yesterday, we had a couple uh, candle patterns that worked pretty well going into today's session. Today, I wanted to highlight Paramount. Paramount Global, one of the top performing S&P names today. On a down day for the S&P and the NASDAQ, Paramount actually managed to uh, close up about 3%. Coming off of the lows, now this is testing a longer term support level, may not be as clear from this zoomed in version, but today we have what's called the bullish engulfing pattern. That's a down day and an up day. Day two, the real body, which is the open up to the close, engulfs the first day's real body, the open down to the close. And that usually implies a short term uh, buy signal. It's basically telling you accumulation during the trading day may mean the next one to three bars is a little higher. So in this sort of environment, when the major averages are struggling, when I find a lot of reasons to be more defensive or be more uh, risk off, charts like this showing bullish short-term developments can be an opportunity for a counter trend move back to the upside. Folks, that's a wrap for this show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Special thank you to Dave Landry of DaveLandry.com joining us from Louisiana. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night. Mm-hmm. <laughs>